In this video, what I want to do is show you how to run a t-test when you are given the data. So what we have here is an article claims that the average number of states that adults in the U.S. have visited is 12. A random sample of 10 adults was collected to test this claim and the data is listed below. Assume the population is normally distributed at alpha equals 0.05. Is there enough evidence to reject the article's claim? All right, with this, I know that I said that I was going to be using the t-test, but there's a couple of things in here that kind of trigger um, that we are using a t-test. And one of them is the fact that we are dealing with the mean or the average, okay? Um, remember that average or mean are interchangeable. And so since it says the average number that needs to trigger that we are either going to be using the z-test for the mean or the t-test for the mean. Okay, so remember the difference between the t-test and the z-test is whether or not you know the population standard deviation. In this one, we don't have any standard deviation listed whatsoever, so what we can say is that we can find the sample standard deviation A, um, but sigma or the population standard deviation is unknown. Okay, so anytime this is the case that you have this sample standard deviation, that needs to trigger that this is going to go towards the t-test. And the t-test is used way more often as the test for the means because most of the time we're not going to know the population standard deviation. But if you do, then you use the z-test. All right, the other things that have to be true is you have to have a random sample and you always wanna check conditions for your specific text. I have been doing this for a very long time and I find that in every textbook that I pick up, the conditions are slightly different. So just make sure that you are looking at the text to, that you have all of them covered that your text requires. All right, and then the last thing that we need is we need to either have a sample size that is greater than or equal to 30 in order for the central limit theorem to kick in, or we have to have that the population is normally distributed. So since it says the population is normally distributed, or we can assume that, we can go ahead and continue. continue. All right, so since the conditions are met. We can use the t-test. So for this one, we are going to be using the t-test. Once you've decided what kind of test you are using and that your conditions are met, you're going to write out your null and your alternative hypotheses. So you always start with conditions so that you know which test that you're going to run. So if we look up here, the null hypothesis is going to be our claim. In this case, um, we are claiming that the mean or the average number of states that adults in the US have visited is 12. So mathematically, we would write that as mu equals 12. Now, depending upon your text, some texts want you to write it out verbally and symbolically. The text I'm currently teaching from just uses um, the symbolic notation, but either one is acceptable. So because this is a statement of equality, the way that you know whether the claim goes in the null hypothesis or the alternative is based on whether the statement contains equality or inequality. Anytime that it is equality, we put it in the null hypothesis. If it was inequality, we would put it in the alternative. So we're going to write that the mean is equal to 12 and you always use mu in the null and the alternative and never x bar. We can find the sample mean, but the claim is about the population mean. All right, so the alternative is always the opposite um, or the complement of this. So the opposite would be that mu is not equal to 12. So that's the alternative hypothesis. If one of these is true, the other one must be false. Okay, this right here tells us that we are going to run a two tail 
test. Okay, and our next step is to write out the important information that we would need in order to show the work. So we need X bar, we need S, we need our sample size, and we need our alpha level. Because this is um, a t-test, if you were using critical values, you would also need the degrees of freedom. It's always good just to write them down to show that you know how to find it. And then we need our alpha level. So the alpha level was 0 0.05. If we look up here, none of the rest of the information is given, but we can easily find that in our calculator when we run the test. So I will write down all of this information in a second because right now we do not know the sample mean, we do not know the sample standard deviation, we know the sample size is 10 and therefore the degrees of freedom would be 9. So if you were choosing to use a rejection region, you would go to your table and you would draw out your critical values and your rejection regions. But I am going to use the p-value decision rule for this one because the calculator gives that to me. So when I do shade on my model, I am going to shade my standardized test statistic t which I can find by doing x bar minus mu divided by s over the square root of n. So as you can see, we can't use this formula right now because we don't know x bar and we don't know s. We can plug in everything else, but those are missing. So I will get those in a second. That way you can show out your work if you're required to show work. So let's grab our calculator. I'm going to go back up to the data. And what we're going to do is we're going to enter this data into L1. Okay, so let me grab my calculator, go to stat and edit, and we're going to just type this data in. I have it on my paper so you can follow along with me or you can pause the video and go back to the data itself. The first value was 8, 5, 13, 23, 8, 5, 15, 9, 10, and 6. Okay, so with this, let me just pause for a second. I'm going to check over my values to make sure I put them in. All right, I verified the data to make sure I put everything in correctly. It's always important that you check your data to make sure that everything goes in correctly because if you enter in something incorrectly, it will give you the wrong answer. All right, so I want to get all of the important information. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit stat and I'm going to go to the tests. I'm just going to go directly to running a t-test in my calculator, which is why it's important to check your conditions and to know which tests that you are running because there's a lot of options on the screen. So I'm going to choose option two. And for this one, you can either use the information where you have the data or you could use stats. You will use stats if you know x bar and s. On this one, we don't know that, so we're going to use the data. Our mu naught is always the number that is in um, the null hypothesis, so mu equals 12. Our list that we used is L1, and we need to make sure that our alternative hypothesis matches down here. And then we would go to calculate. So the alternative is always going to tell you the tail of the test, whether you have two tail, left tail, or right tail. All right, so I ran the test in here. This does give me the answer to T, which is the standardized test statistic. It gives us our p-value, which is what I'm going to use to help us compare and come to our conclusion. It also gives us X bar, which is the sample mean and the sample standard deviation, as well as the sample size. All right, so in case you are required to show work, which I know I require of my students, um, you can go ahead and write down that information. So we found that X bar was 10.2, and we found that S is approximately 5.55. And then I can show the work that I wanted to plug in the 10.2 minus 5.554, and I just put in the wrong thing, sorry. I was looking at the next number. I want to put mu in, which is this value up here. So mu is always what's in the null hypothesis, so that would be 12, divided by 5.554 over the square root of 10. Now, if you were plugging this into your calculator, make sure that you put both the numerator and denominator, but we don't need to because we already found that the answer to this is negative 1.02. So your calculator went ahead and plugged in all of those values into this formula because that's what it's programmed with. Okay, our p-value, 
is the p equals on the screen and that value is 0 0.3322 if I round it to four decimal places. All right, we still have to shade our model and you could go ahead and shade it with this value negative 1.02 and this value here, or you can also rerun it back in your calculator again. And you can just this time, instead of going to calculate, go down to draw and hit enter and it will show you what your picture should look like. So it'll show you that you should shade at negative 1.02. So this is listed out as 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 standard deviations below and 1, 2, 3, 4 standard deviations above. Okay, so that's what your picture should look like. And we want to shade both tails because it's a two tail test. So our data in this one, while it was not exactly equal to 12, we have a p-value of 0.332. So that means that if the null hypothesis were true, we would expect to see data like this approximately 33% of the time. So that's pretty high. And remember the way that you make your decision when you're using the p-value decision rule is you compare the p-value to alpha. And if alpha, or if our p-value is less than or equal to alpha, then we reject. If our p-value is greater than alpha, then we fail to reject. So on this one, since our p-value is greater than alpha, we would fail to reject So this would be our conclusion. And then after you have made your decision, it's always best to write an interpretation in the context of the original problem. If you are doing AP stats, make sure that you reference your p-value in your description. So you would say something like at alpha equals 5%, um, or since our p-value of 0 0.3322 is greater than our alpha level, you would write it like that. Um, my textbook that I'm working from currently doesn't go into putting p-value in the conclusion. It kind of just depends on the textbook that you are using. So with the textbook that I'm using, um, the method that they suggest is at 5%. So you always want to put your alpha level and I put it as a percentage because if I reference alpha in my description, nobody's going to understand that. But people understand 5%. So at 5%, we, and because of the fact that our claim was about the null hypothesis and we are failing to reject this, that means that we are not rejecting the claim. So we do not have enough evidence to reject the claim. that the average number of states an adult in the U.S. has visited. is 12. So based on this sample of 10, we do not have enough evidence to reject the claim. It does not mean that this might not be true. It just means that our evidence points towards this. A sample of 10 is usually not a very large sample. And so you would probably retest this with a larger sample. Like if you wanted to have a more accurate test, you would probably run this with a lot more data points. So just to recap a hypothesis test, when you're running a hypothesis test, you first want to look for words like mean or proportion to help you determine which kind of test you're using. You want to go through the conditions for your tests. You want to state the null and the alternative, show out your work and draw your model, and then come to your conclusion. As always, thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know. If there are additional topics you need me to cover, please let me know that as well.